groups. A group is simply a container in which you can add user accounts and then you're able to assign permissions to the group to do things. So why use groups? Well, groups enable you to assign permissions and other attributes to multiple users in a single operation, or to send email to a large group of users if you have something like Microsoft Exchange installed. So consider this example. Let's say we have a sales department with 100 users and a marketing department with another 100 users. Now that's 200 different user accounts you'll need to create. Now you need to allow the 100 sales users access to a sales folder to make changes. The marketing department needs to be able to read the contents of this folder in order to work out what products need more marketing. Now quite clearly here, the salespeople need to be able to read and write to this folder. The marketing department only need to read this information. So what do we do? Well, without the concept of groups, we would need to assign the correct object permissions to every one of the 200 individual users. Now that's a lot of work. Using groups, we can simply add each of the salespeople into a group called sales, we would then add the marketing users into a different group called marketing, and then we just add the permissions to each group to be able to read or read and write to the folder as the case may be. To create a new group using Active Directory Users and Computers, we can simply right click on the OU that we want to create the new group in and select New Group. Now this brings up the New Group Object dialog box. In the first field, we need to give their new group a name. So we'll just call this one Sales. Now like when we created a user account, we must also supply a pre-Windows 2000 group name. Again, it simply defaults to what we just typed above, which is Sales. Now by default, the scope of the group is Global, and the group type is Security. So let's talk a little bit about the differences between them. The first type of group is a machine local group. Often just referred to as a local group, machine local groups really only exist to provide backward compatibility to NT4. Machine local groups cannot exist on a domain controller, only on a member server, and they only provide resource permissions on the server in which the group exists. Now you can however include in a machine local group members from any domain within a forest, from trusted domains in other forests, and from trusted down-level domains. A domain local group can contain users, other domain local groups from the same domain, global groups from any domain in the forest, and they can also contain universal groups. Now you can also assign permissions to resources to domain local groups, but only to resources that exist in the same domain. Now global groups also contain users and other global groups from the same domain. And unlike domain local groups, you can also assign permissions to resources for any object in your forest. Global groups are included in the global catalog, but their members aren't, and global groups only get replicated within their own domain. So the best practice is to assign user accounts to global groups. Then assign the global group to a domain local group. Now universal groups, on the other hand, are the most flexible. A universal group can contain other universal groups, global groups, and users from any domain in the forest. You can also assign permission to objects in a universal group. Now unlike global groups, universal groups do appear in the global catalog with their members, and by assigning global groups to universal groups, you reduce the replication traffic to the global catalog as changes to global groups generally occur more frequently than changes to universal groups. When working with universal groups, it's best practice to assign users to global groups and then the global group to a universal group and then assign the universal group to the domain local group. But remember, to be able to create a universal group, your domain functional level must be at Windows 2000 native or Windows Server 2003. Now with security groups, you can assign permissions. This simply means that if it's a folder or a printer, for example, that you wish to share and then allow or deny access to, then you must use a security group. Like user accounts, security groups are assigned a security ID, and because of this SID, you can assign permissions to a security group. 
but on the other hand, distribution groups are intended solely for the purpose of email distribution lists. Now with that in mind, you can actually use a security group for this purpose as well. Now distribution groups do not have a security ID and that's why you cannot assign permissions to distribution groups. So to recap on these two, if you do want to assign permissions to a group, then you must use a security group. It's that simple. Okay, now for this sales group that we're creating, we'll use the default group scope of global and we'll also use the default group type of security. And then we'll click OK. Now here we can see our sales group has been created. Now one thing I'd like to add quickly is if you do like to use the net group command to add groups from the command line, they will always be created in the user's OU. Now of course you can move them afterwards, but by default this is where they'll be placed. In fact we'll go and do that now, we'll open a command prompt and we'll type in net group slash add to add a new group and then we'll call this one marketing and we'll hit enter and we can see the command completed successfully we'll just close this down we'll go to our users group and refresh the screen and here we can see our marketing group was in fact created in our users OU now in Active Directory users and computers groups can easily be identified by its two headed icon here in contrast user accounts will have a single headed icon like we see up here with the administrator account. Now so let's right click on our sales group and we'll select properties. The default tab is the general tab. Here we can see we have the pre Windows 2000 name of sales. Now you can change this name if you wish although changing this will not affect the name of the group in our domain. So let me just demonstrate this. We'll just add 123 after our sales pre Windows 2000 name and we'll click OK. Now down here we can see that our sales group in fact hasn't visually changed. So we'll right click, go back into properties and yes we can see that our pre Windows 2000 name here is in fact sales 123. So I'll just go back and remove that. OK, so we have a few more things we'd like to go through here. Now as you can see the next item is description. So here we can enter a description for our group. Now if you do enter a description here, this will display the description in the column of our Active Directory Users and Computers MMC. So if we enter here, Sales People, and we'll click OK, we can see here that our description in fact has changed to Sales People. So using that is probably a good idea if you want to quickly identify what the group's actually for. Now we can also enter an email address. Now if we're going to use this group as an email distribution list, we would enter that here. So in other words, if we wanted to have a generic sales email distribution list, we could simply enter sales at testdomain.com and then when anyone sends an email to that, it would go to all of the recipients that we have in our sales group. Of course down here, these things here probably look familiar because we've just gone through them. We can of course change our group scope to either universal or back to global if we have changed it and of course we can change our group to a distribution type if we wish. Now a word of warning if you do decide to change from a security group to a distribution group you can but you will lose any permissions that you have assigned to the security group so bear that in mind before we do that. Now on the members tab here is where we can add new users or groups to our sales group so to add a new user or group we simply click add. Now if you do know the name of the user or group you wish to add you can type it directly in this box here and then click on check name. If the user or group doesn't exist you will receive a message telling you that the object cannot be found. But if you would prefer to browse for a user or group click on the advanced button and then click on find now. This will bring up a list of all of the users and groups we have in our Active Directory domain. So we'll simply leave the administrator one highlighted and we'll click OK. We can see the administrator's name has been put in here into our box. We'll click OK again. And now the administrator account is part of our sales group. If we need to remove a user or group from our sales group, we can simply highlight the group or user and select remove and then selecting yes with the confirmation message. Where the member tab allowed you to add users to the sales group, the member of tab allows you to make the sales group a member of other groups. 
This is simply a time saving feature here because let's say I'm doing some other work on the sales group and then I want to add the sales group to say the domain admins group. Rather than closing this and then opening a domain admins group, I can simply just follow the same process by clicking add, advanced, find now, and you'll notice here that we only have groups listed. I could then select the domain admins group, click OK, click OK again, and now members that are in the sales group now are also members of the domain admins group. Although generally I wouldn't recommend that we give salespeople domain admin rights, so I'll just simply go and remove that one. Next we have the manage by tab. This lets you specify information about who is responsible for maintaining this group object. Now by default this is empty, but to add a responsible person we'll click change, follow the same process, click advanced, find now, and then we'll see here all of the users that we have available. Well currently I only have the administrator user so we'll click OK, we'll click OK again, and now we can see that the administrator account is the responsible person for this group object. Now with the manager can update membership list box, currently that is unchecked. Now we have actually given our manager of this particular group object to the administrator account, which has global privileges anyway. But if we decided to add a, a generic user to this uh, manage box here, what we could do is allow that user to then make changes to this group by clicking this box. Now the final two tabs we have here, object and security, will only be visible if you have the advanced features of Active Directory users and computers enabled. Now to do that, you simply go up to the view menu and select advanced features. So we'll go back in, select properties, and go to our object tab. Now the object tab just tells us a little bit of information about our group. First we can see the object class is in fact group. We can see when it was created and the last time it was modified. Now down here we have the update sequence numbers. These numbers simply tell Active Directory whether or not any change has been made to this object. We can see its current number is 28,137, yet its original number was slightly less of 28,128. Now this does indicate to Active Directory that when replication occurs, this particular item will need to be replicated to any other domain controllers because its update sequence number has changed. This just ensures that the rest of our domain controllers are updated with the correct information. Now the last tab is our security tab, and I'm sure this one looks familiar to you. This tab just enables you to set permissions to users or other groups that specify which users or groups can actually modify our sales group we've made now. Okay, so that was a long discussion about groups. Now you can probably see the immediate benefit, especially in a large organization, of using groups to control access to resources. We took a look at domain local groups, global groups, and universal groups, and we also discussed the difference between security and distribution groups. So as we wrap up our discussion of groups, a final warning is remember if you do need to assign permissions to a group, then you will need to make the group a security group.